It's BPM and Diplo's Revolution here on Sirius XM. I'm Danny Valentino. Welcome to our virtual town hall event. And uh, just to paint the picture a little bit for those who uh, might be listening in the car or at home, we're joined by a virtual studio audience. We have about 50 lucky winners with us from all across the country. <laughs> and I know they have questions for our special guest. And uh, we're going to get to those a bit later on. Can't wait for that. But Let's welcome uh, someone now to the room who might just be coming off the, the best weekend ever. I mean, his new <laughs> album, Nurture, is out. Uh, he just hosted his own virtual festival, which is incredible, yeah. on Saturday, Secret Sky number two. Let's welcome Porter Robinson. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, best weekend ever was like, it was, it was, it was. That's right. There's nothing more to it than that. It was the best weekend ever. <laughs> you you know hear the applause from everybody. We can't see them, but I hear everybody clapping. They're all, they're very excited. Uh, um, I think I can't hear y'all. I, yeah, I'm only, yeah, I'm only hearing the one audio feedback. So, um, but thank you. <laughs> have you done something like this before virtual town hall or is this your first time? This is round one for me. The only sort of analog to this that I can think of would be like going into VR maybe as myself a couple times and and like talking to a bunch of people at the same time but um this is nice this is structured so I, th I think it'll I think this will be a cool experience it's really cool I, like I want to see it's been so long I think since I've like I don't know like it's really actually seen my audience in any real way like it, it's you know even doing something like Secret Sky like this past weekend, you're just like, I was playing to like nobody, you know? So it's like, uh, it's something I really miss. Well, the album is out. It's an amazing accomplishment. Um, can you believe it that, uh, that we've reached this point finally? No, I mean, I, I remember there being so many points where I really thought that I was not going to be complete, able to complete the second album. And so that's the thing that I, try to stop myself with the most this weekend as it's coming out and we're getting all this stuff back about like you know streaming numbers and album sales and stuff like that like the thing that I'm trying the hardest to celebrate is to stop myself and remember the porter of four years ago who was not convinced that this was going to be possible and just to be like everything else aside like you actually finish this album like it's out there like it didn't leak it it came out the exact right way and like that's the thing I'm the most grateful for, I think, is that like people were able to hear it at the right time in the right way. And it was able to, I was able to have my time to develop it. So now I, I really can't believe it. Yeah. I mean, the narrative has been first new album in seven years, which can be misleading because someone might hear that and say, wow, he hasn't done anything for a long time, but we all know that's not been true. Sitting I mean, on my butt. Yeah. <laughs> martinis on the beach, everything, the nine yards has been awesome. <laughs> We had Shelter with, uh, with yeah. Maddie on. We had the virtual self era, which was uh, some amazing music, ghost voices, just incredible. Thank you were being you. productive. You were releasing great music, mm -hmm. but the struggle for you to make Nurture was very real. I mean, mm -hmm. take us through that a little bit. Right. So the, the, the best way I can characterize it is like after Worlds came out and after like some time spent touring Worlds Live, I really like sort of came back in the studio with a good bit of confidence thinking like I knew what I needed the next thing to be. And, you know, I've told this story so many times now, so pardon me if I'm falling back on, on some cliches here, but, um, you know, I, I just struggled and like, I was coming up with nothing basically. And then that, the, the, the biggest issue there was that like the way that I reacted to that because I think every artist has these ups and downs I just happened to hit one of those valleys but I completely panicked and so I started coming to the studio every day with this desire to like, prove that I could still do it which is really antithetical I think to creativity and to making music that's like a very ego driven thing um it's really hard to lose yourself in that and to like truly be curious and explore all these things that are connected to creativity I was just like it was like this white white knuckle on the mouse like just been like, oh my God, if I don't make something today, like I'm truly screwed. That was how I felt for, for years and years. And although I did Shelter in 2016, like if you could have heard the music that Madion was sending me that year, he was sending me like, it felt like 10 amazing tracks a day. It was very early days of him putting together Good Faith. And I was just like, I have nothing. And, um, but it, you know, the music he was sending me to was also really inspirational because he was like singing on his own music and it would, took this turn towards pop and I was like, this is so cool. And he's putting all these effects on his voice. And it definitely like some seeds were starting to grow there. Um, but yeah, I basically spun my wheels until like 2017 when I semi 
gave up on the idea and was like, I'm just going to do like a side project and try to explore a different influence because like making music under Porter Robinson is becoming too much pressure for me. And uh, that really helped get things unstuck. And then like 2018, 2019, 2020, those were the big years of like being super productive with my music. And those, those were amazing, amazing times because it was like, I had more ideas than what I than I knew what to do with. So like, I'm just so I'm so grateful that it's even done. The album comes out. I mean, what's your Friday like? I mean, are you are you like pouring over social media looking for reaction? Are you are you like obsessing over the reviews, or do you try and avoid all that and maybe you know just go get a massage or something? Uh, so Friday was the day that it came out, right? So I played League of Legends all Friday. Um, I that Perfect. was like that was mostly what I did um I like I hit up some friends I was like you guys I like I feel like I've been so glued to Twitter like I really really need to not look at this for a second uh because it was just so so overwhelming um and it was all positive but it's like I, I think I've grown to be kind of wary of like getting really addicted to that that positive feedback and to that, that like attention and stuff like that but the, the main thing that I pulled away from it feeling was like wow, people like this so much more than I was expecting. Because I, I always felt like the reaction to the singles was like more mixed than I expected. But then I felt the reaction to the album was more positive than I expected. So like, I, I was just, I was totally taking that as a W. I was like, all right, like, it's, it's awesome. It's crazy. I feel like a spark in the air, like around nurture that I don't think I've felt since like worlds, to be honest. So I, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, you know, like you, there's so much self-doubt that leads into a project like this. And like, you don't know how it's going to be received until the moment it's out there. So, um, but like the thing I was telling myself leading up to the release was like, like, dude, like there is nothing that I could have like done differently. I don't think I like, I don't think I could have worked any harder on this. So like, yeah, I just, it's just, it's just, it's just gratitude, honestly. And, and uh, cause I, uh, there was such a period of time where I was like, I don't know if this album is going to exist. And then it did. And so everything else is a bonus is icing on the cake for sure. That's gotta be a great feeling knowing that you gave it your all and you're satisfied. And then you get right into it on Saturday. You get to play the songs live uh, for the mm -hmm. first time with the, yeah. uh, the secret sky festival. Uh, I mean, that was incredible, right? I honestly think it was up there with the best live streams during the pandemic. And we've seen plenty uh, over the past year, yeah. nine you. hours of music. Uh, a lot of it, you know, donations went to a great cause. So we love to see that. Uh, many of our listeners, I think probably heard it uh, on Diplo's revolution, maybe caught it yeah. online. Thanks for maybe, stream. Absolutely. Uh, maybe saw it in virtual reality. I know some of them did, but uh, just in case people didn't see it, I mean, this wasn't just you standing in front of turntables. I mean, you're yeah. doing it all up there, like a one man band, right? You're playing <laughs> piano, uh, you're tearing up the synths and then you're, you're yeah. actually singing. So yeah, take us through the day and, uh, just how did it all go from your perspective? Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's funny. It's like a one man band with a lot of backing tracks <laughs> for sure. It's, right. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, I'm certainly not like, uh, standing up there with like an accordion and a pedal. That is a dope future live show idea though. Um, that, that could be my 2023 show, <laughs> a true sure. one man. Um, but no, yeah, it was like, to be honest, like playing Nurture Live for the first time, it was, uh, like so much went into it. So like I arranged the whole show from the moment I turned in the album, um, from the moment I turned in the album, I, I started working on the live show. So I started putting together new arrangements and at first I felt like, you know, I, I don't think I want to change the songs too much. Like I thought my vision of what a nurture live show would be, would be kind of like maybe like the highlights of my own music, like my own favorite songs pretty much unchanged. But then I was like, ah, maybe it'd be cool to like, if I start a song with a different intro and then people will wonder for a second, oh, what is this? And then they get hit with a vocal and then they realize what song it is. Like that's how Get Your Wish came together. But once I started playing with it, I couldn't stop. And I, I would like keep, making more and more changes and like remixing it more and more and so then like you know it, it was it was weeks and weeks and weeks as well of pouring over the the visuals like the the workflow of of, of putting together the visuals is like me and a, and a team of people and we like we all have like premiere open and we're editing visuals to a timeline 
And that, that took weeks as well. And I, that was like, that was something that I did like 14 hours a day for, for several weeks was like obsessing wow. over this. And all the content is made by other people, but like the ideas and the arrangement, that's where I'm collaborating. I'm like, oh no, like on the third beat here, the screen needs to turn off and then there needs to be like a white. So it's like, you know, there was all of that. And then, you know, trying to get to a place where I felt like I could really sing the material live and preparing all the like vocal chains to do the weird voice effect that I do. And when I got up there, I was like, blissing out I was like it it's like it's all coming together like I'm standing on this LED stage with these visuals and I'm like I'm I've fantasized about playing these songs for so long I visualized what it would be like to run around the stage with the mic in my hand and like it, it was like I was like oh boy like it was that it was definitely that powerful sense of meaning where I was like it was a real like dream come true and, and I'm very, very excited to do it in real time live with people. Something tells me there's going to be a, a nurture live tour, maybe in the future. <laughs> it sounds, I mean, if it takes me seven years to make an album, I would be crazy not to, to take it on tour. Yeah, I would love, to, I have, I'm, I'm definitely planning on taking nurture on tour. We'll see like, you know, when that can actually happen. Um, but yeah, like I want to expand the show to even more than what it already is now though too like there's so many songs I wanted to play that I just didn't have the time to put together a new version and all the visuals for so I was able to like it's like a, it was like an hour and five minute long live show um but I, I definitely want it to be longer than that so I uh I that's kind of what I'm doing today once we get off uh this call I'm going to go back to making more more live versions and stuff like that just so you know the chat's burning up everybody's got their city where you need to go on the tour so we can uh, get to the uh, the audience in just a bit but I want to take a step back if we can I mean we, we've all had our lives turn upside down over the past year I mean the pandemic everything we took for granted gone right being able to see family freely uh going to see live shows just taken away and as we finally I think come out of this uh hopefully Anything that you in particular have taken away uh, from this past year um, and what might your feelings be about, you know, getting back to this sense of normalcy in, in both your personal and professional life? I think the, the biggest thing for me of this last year, it's, it's strange, but like, I feel like I connected with my friends so, so much more than I had in the past. Like, I think, you know, a lot of my, my friends are people who are touring and so we're normally all too busy to catch each other, but we were just like on Discord every night, like all playing games together. And like, I felt like all my friendships got so much stronger. And I felt like I sort of, you know, this is like the happy ending at the end of the episode. I learned the power of friendship. I, but I genuinely did. Like I, I, I've come to realize how much I love all my homies so much. And I just like want to work together with all of them and make music. Like my vision of the future is like being in the studio with friends again. I really miss that. Like I, I felt like, with nurture, I, I felt like I had so much to prove, you know, like I was trying to prove to myself that, that I could still do it and that I could still come up with a new idea. And now I don't feel that anymore. I'm like, I just want to have fun. I just want to like enjoy my time making music with my homies. So like that, that's really, I, I really feel like my friendships were bolstered during the last year. And the other thing is that like, like my own sense of gratitude around everything is X3. Like, um, both in terms of the things that I missed this year, like seeing live music and touring and seeing the world and gathering with friends, all these other things, like going to restaurants, like, you know, me, me and my girlfriend, Rika, we're both fully vaccinated and we went to an outdoor restaurant the other day and we were like, wait, why is this so good? And we realized it's because we had been eating food delivery for the last year and like, wait, hot food? smacks like we're like <laughs> i forgot how good like hot restaurant food actually is um so like yeah like there's a lot of gratitude around the things you miss but also like i've been trying to cultivate a real sense of gratitude around like being able to have a year like at home and like where all my friends are playing games together and stuff like that and like i i know that there will come a time where i look back on this with some amount of affection um obviously the the all the suffering that's gone along with this notwithstanding, but you know, with, with every horrible thing, there's, there's usually some kind of weird silver lining and yeah, th you know, there's, there's elements of this really bad time that I think will, we may look back on with some sense of fondness in the future. So um, yeah, it's I would maybe just gratitude. 
Yeah. The opportunity, like you're saying, hot food smacks to go out and eat in a restaurant. It's an amazing thing. How many people are looking forward to going to that first festival again and what yeah. that's going to feel like? I mean, mm -hmm. we went to how many of those over the past five, 10 years? And, and mm -hmm. we knew at the time that it was special, but after going through this now and having it taken away from us for, you know, 13, 14 months, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of tears at that first uh, festival back. And uh, maybe even for you, uh, when you take the stage in front of a live audience again, huh? Me too. I mean, I, it was weird. I was like feeling nostalgic the other day and I was watching YouTube videos of like a, my own shows, <laughs> which is a very indulgent thing to do. But I was like wanting to see what it was like and like hearing the sound of a crowd and hearing people sing the lyrics just to my old songs. I was like, <gasps> I was like, oh my God, like this, this is the best feeling ever. And like, I, I don't even know if I'm ready to hear people singing the lyrics to the new songs. Like I, I, I think the first time I take the stage and I hear people singing the new songs back to me, I'm going to be like, oh my God. <laughs> I, I just, I absolutely can't wait. And it's like, I think my affection for all kinds of music has grown too. Like this album, I would say is mostly centered around whatever this kind of alien breed of digital pop that I make is and ambient music were the main two things that I was thinking about. But like my love for club music has gone up in the last year like my my love for like all music has, has gone up in, in in various ways and like oh my god like I want to make ballads but I also want to make like club music and like I don't know I, I I get this feeling when I'm really inspired that like I want to do everything and and I it's hard for me to get away from that when I'm feeling good for sure um so yeah it's like it's love across the board <laughs> this seems like a good time to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we have. Uh, I'm starting to let some of the uh, audience members in, and we'll get to those in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about maybe making dance music again. So now that Nurture is out, obviously that's going to be the focus for a while. Uh, maybe a Nurture live tour, like we talked about. I think uh, the you're going to curate a festival again in the fall. But what's next? Mm -hmm. I mean, what direction might you uh, take things next uh, musically? I, I have no idea, man. I I, uh, I often think about like dude I wish that God could come down from the heavens and show me like the thing I'm going to do five years from now like as though that's going to be his message this is a very trivial thing for God uh, but I, <laughs> this is probably not at the top of the checklist showing me my <laughs> future music but I I, I often I'm like I, damn I wish I could hear some of this what this sounds like for the first time and I like I wish I could know what's going to be interesting to me a few years down the line like I, I really I genuinely have no idea I have like some small things in my head that I'm kicking around like oh maybe I could explore this um but right now I'm in that phase of just one kind of basking in the fact like oh it's out that's amazing and two like trying to cultivate new influences for sure like I uh, I'm spending so much time like I, I went for a long drive today just listening to my goal for the day was to like listen to songs that I didn't think I was gonna like like to see if I could find something new because like there's this thing with music there's this like repeat exposure effect where the more times you hear something the more likely you are to enjoy it and I think a really important thing for artists is to like cultivate new loves and find new things to enjoy so that was kind of my mission for this morning was like let me go for a drive for and listen to some music that I'm like not really sure about um, and see if I can find a way into loving this because like I'm like always wanting new influences. Sounds great. Well, I enjoy chatting with you and I'm so excited now to uh, welcome in our studio audience and they've been going crazy in the chat, naming their favorite <laughs> songs off the album, uh, telling you where you need to bring the, the live tour. Uh, so we're, we're going to get to um, our first question here is uh, from Adam Ramirez and uh, Adam is in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. Adam. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, now guys. that nurture is complete, what song feels the most distant from the person you are today? And what song do you still feel closest with? That's a banger of a question, Adam. Um, Thank you. Do you mean on the album? Oh uh, yeah, on, on the album. Um, what feels the most distant from who I am today? It's, uh, so like Lifelike and Something Comforting were started really, really, really early on, like 2015. And um, I think like, my initial idea of what I wanted Nurture to be was I knew I wanted it to be like this ode to reality and something that felt really kind of 
like real life and it hit, you know, those grassy meadows and those blue skies and stuff like that. And something like life, like has a little bit of like an RPG vibe, which is still a little video gamey. So I can feel the, like the world's post world's influence there, but I still love that song. I think it's a really, really beautiful melody. I, I stand by it. And something comforting was like started so early and it has like an instrumental drop. Um, so that feels a little distant, but like, I don't know. I mean, I cut so many songs from Nurture that everything that remains is something that like, I love 10 out of 10. Like I can say that for real. Like I, I really stand by all of it. And then maybe the thing that's closest to where I'm at right now would be musician, I think, because um, once I like had a sense of what Nurture was supposed to be, and like, I felt like I'd really expressed the aesthetic of, of nurture, like musician felt like maybe the next thing I wanted to explore, which was something that was like more pure fun with like more of a synthy vibe and like up-tempo drums. And so like, I think musician ultimately landed on the album because the lyrics are still so much about making music. It's like, it has a, a focus of, of like the process. So I'm like, oh, that's a nurture song. But yeah, that, that's, that's my best answer. <laughs> that's a banger of a question, Adam, you, you smashed that. 10 out of 10. Thank you. I'm not reading everyone's questions, by the way. Don't be nervous. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you, Adam. Uh, great yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go now to, uh, to Denver, Colorado, and uh, we've got Ashley, who has a question for Porter. So it seems like nurture has been a very therapeutic and cathartic experience for you, full of self-growth um, and self-discovery. So I'm interested to know how you got to that place of understanding and awareness. And I'm also curious if you have any tips or things that help you become more grounded or like live more mindfully mm. when things are upsetting or stressful? That's a really, really good question. And it's like, there's a, there's a part of me that like, I always hesitate, I think a, a bit with this because like, I, I think there are people that maybe do like self-help and stuff better than me, but uh, I, I would say I mean, it was such a, a multi-tiered approach that got me to where I am now. I think um, like therapy was a big part of it. I mean, uh, that that's that's just real. Like I was going to therapy every week and continued through the pandemic on the phone. Um, like finding somebody who's a good fit for you is 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 a I think a, a big big part of of that particular kind of growth, but. Um, I don't know. I also think like maybe trying to change from like a, a fixed mindset to a growth mindset was another thing too, where like I was taking all of my works in progress. Everything that I worked on is this evaluation of who I was, like, like what I'm making says something about me. And it's so much better if you can take your own works in progress and the things that you're trying to do as opportunities for lessons and opportunities for growth. Um, it, like it's you you find so much more flexibility in that place of being like it doesn't really matter if the thing I'm making or the thing I'm doing is perfect or not all that matters is that I'm moving forward and I'm trying and um yeah when you turn your your mentality to focus on I think improvement over time and understand that that's like a zigzag um it's a lot healthier than being like I have to be great now the other thing that I I, I think is really helpful and I've talked about this a lot is like trying to cultivate new things to love and not not over relying on recreating nostalgia I'm a very very nostalgic person so maybe this only pertains to me but I've found mixed results trying to recreate things that I used to love like oftentimes something that is very nostalgic for me it was great because of the person I was in that moment and the exact circumstances of that moment and it's nice to recreate those things and there's no shame in going back but I try to spend just as much time like finding new things to love and, and doing things that scare me and like having new experiences above trying to like go back. So that, that's another thing that's been helpful. I, I'm sorry if uh, this doesn't sufficiently address the question about like mental health. It's like, I'm talking a little bit more about creativity because that's like where my, my brain it's is at. Of it, for sure. No, yeah, I think so too, but... they're connected. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks Ashley. Great. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, we're going to go to Florida. Uh, next question uh, comes to us from uh, Brennan Dominguez. Hi, Brennan. Do you intend on making music for the rest of your life? Or like, for example, do you see yourself at the age of 40 still placing MIDI notes and singing over tracks? <laughs> you just, uh, you've just glimpsed into like my 
my daily crisis actually where I, I, I ask myself that same question a lot um, where I'm like what is what is my what do I want my life to be like in like 15 years because um, you know I'm like 28 about to be 29 and I'm like I, I think the most important thing for me is to be happy and to to like be balanced um, but at the same time, like the idea of not having some kind of creative outlet for me actually scares the bejesus out of me. Like I, I, the idea of not doing this forever actually really scares me. So it, it's like, I don't know. I want to make music forever, um, but uh, we're all going to die someday. <laughs> Let's keep it light uh, with the, yeah, my bad. I took it straight to death. But um, yeah, I, I I don't know what the the future holds for me. I I I do think I'll continue to do something creative as long as I live, though. Because like I think if I said tomorrow like I'm quitting making music, I might make the best music I've ever made in my life. Like right after that, you know. So uh, I I don't know if it's something I can control. But like in, yeah, in terms of like having this like career under my own name and like being at the center of all of it. I might not be doing that when I'm 65. Um, but yeah, I, uh, for the foreseeable future, I, I plan on continuing to make music. Like I'm, I'm like, it's literally the day I turned in Nurture, I was like, oh my God, what's the next thing? Like, I can't wait to do this again. Like there's a lyric in the last song, trying to feel alive, where it's like, you climbed a mountain, are you, sta are you satisfied? As you stand at the top, you already want to do this one more time. Um, and that's how I feel. I was like, I, you know, trying to feel alive is the last song written for Nurture. And I was, that was like a reckoning with how far things have come and the album being done. And yeah, I couldn't shake that feeling of like already wanting to, to go on the roller coaster again. And uh, yeah, and same thing with like as soon as Secret Sky aired, I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to interpret the other songs on the album for the live version. So like, I don't know, I, I just can't stop. <laughs> well, thank you, Brennan, and uh, appreciate the tie. Definitely uh, dressed uh, yeah, for wait. the occasion. That, the drip was actually crazy, I, I, I meant to say. <laughs> thank you, Porter. <laughs> We're gonna go to uh, Philadelphia now. Uh, next question comes to us from uh, Drew Moore. Hi, Drew. I've seen you live a bunch of times. Um, and it's obvious how much you care about your live shows. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you feel like the live shows are so important and why you go to the lengths that you do to create such an experience. Thank you. Thank, thanks for that question. Um, like, I think for me, what I'm trying to do when I make music is I'm always trying to write a love letter to something that I really enjoy. So like, you know, if I'm like riding around in the car and I'm listening to like, really really beautiful like j-pop or something for example and it's like making me get teary i'm like oh this is like i want to live some aspect of that or like you know like i was watching james ivy set at secret sky the other day and i was like oh my god like this is such a cool world like i want to immerse myself in this too and then same thing watching like imanu and Boonshin. i'm like oh this makes me want to make like crazy experimental club music again and so like i think what i'm trying to do with music most of the time is to find something that I love and immerse myself in it as fully as possible. And like, I, I find the only way for me to get closer to the things that I really love is to like, find, like resynthesize them through my own taste and through the other things that I like and like find a way of repackaging those things. And like the live performance is like the most immersive part of it for me. So like, if you think about like virtual self stage production, I don't know if you know what that looks like, but it's like, I'm standing in this sea of lights and same with like the nurture stage. It's like, I'm standing on these LED panels and it's like, cause I'm trying to like take a bath in the music. Like I'm trying to, whatever this thing is that I want to express this love for, I, the live show is the place where like, it, it really, really becomes real for me. So like, that's why I obsess so much over the visuals and like making sure it all matches and making sure it's timed out properly. And that like the sounds are properly represented because like, to not do that for me is like a missed opportunity of like bringing the music to into reality. 
Um, so I like literally my favorite part of the entire process by far is rehearsals, lighting and visual programming. Like we get like a couple weeks in a, in a big rehearsal space with the whole production. And I just like, I'm running from station to station be like, oh, this like yeah. this light needs to come on here. And like, oh, and you know, I'm not, I'm not running the entire show. Like my VJs and and my my LD, Ben Coker, you know, both said they're they have their geniuses and I could never do everything that they do. Um, but like it's that's the most fun for me because like I get to just like watch the music come to life. So it'll come to life. So yeah, that's why that's um that's why it's so important to me. It's because it's like it's the moment where I get to seal the deal, I feel like. Yeah, I can tell you, it doesn't go unappreciated. It's like, I try to tell all my friends to go to your shows because I'm like, if you've seen a regular DJ set, like, what Porter does, it's <laughs> like, it's to the next level. So thank you so much oh, for answering my question. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for telling your friends to, to come see my shows and yes. thanks for coming to see my shows. I, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it means so much. Can't wait to thank see you, you Drew. That was, thanks so much, Drew, for the question. Um, and you just announced, Porter, I think that you're bringing your festival back in real life uh, in September. Uh, is that right? That's right. Yeah, we're doing um, we're doing Second Sky, which is way too similarly named to Secret Sky. I That's got confused me. about fifteen times when talking my about it and promoting. Dude, it, so. It's not just you. Like <laughs> I do it. Like my manager does it. It's so. It's such a problem. I got to rename one of them. I think, dude, it's such a problem. Second Sky is the real life one. Secret Sky is the digital one. Second Sky, and, and it was all for this like stupid pun. It was not worth. Um, yeah, Second Sky is happening in the fall. It's coming back to the Bay Area. Um, I love the lineup so much. My lips are sealed, but it's like being rolled out over the next week. And uh, yeah, I, I cannot wait. It's going to be incredible. <laughs> uh, a couple more questions that uh, we're going to get to. We have uh, Cheyenne Wyoming in the house. Let's say hi to uh, Jacob. What's your question for Porter? You recently said that you were super stoked to figure out how to um, figure figure out a way how to pitch your vocals for mm -hmm. the live show. And mm -hmm. uh, you've never necessarily written music for the live aspect, but I mm -hmm. wanted to know sort of what kind of struggles that you've had to sort of work around in like, reverse engineering music to in order to uh, yeah, it, a live experience. That's a, that's a great question, Jacob. Um, and first of all, thank you so much. I, I Something that was so helpful for me over the course of these last seven years, not knowing if I was gonna be able to do this album was the fact that I felt like my audience like completely had my back and never was putting excessive pressure on me and knew that I feel like the best thing about my relationship to y'all is that I get the sense that the people who really follow me closely trust that everything that I'm going to do is going to be fully sincere and that like I'm not going to put something out just for purely commercial reasons and I'm not going to rush something out because I think I need to put music out like that trust means the world to me um and you know I I won't defy it and uh it's like it it really enables me to do what I do so thank you for waiting and thanks for thanks so much for your question um and yeah, translating it to, to the live show, um, it was about uh, a, maybe two weeks of uh, Racy, uh, who run, she runs my uh, she runs my Ableton setup for the live show, and we just worked together. And it was basically taking my vocal chains in FL and screenshotting all of that information and because there's no way to like straight up move a vocal chain from FL into Ableton and just kind of meticulously recreating those things and keeping it under 10 milliseconds of latency. Because, you know, my vocal effects chains that I use in the box when I'm producing are like, they have a huge amount of delay. So that doesn't work for the live. So we had to try to get as close as possible um, just using the, just using like live plugins. Um, and I think it's, I think we got really, really, really close. Like I remember, in the studio when we were working on this, you know, obviously all masked up and everything. Um, but when we were, when we were in like all windows doors open, all this stuff like that. But when we were working on it, um, I, <laughs> we did, we made the vocal chain 
for a musician and we ran it for the first time. And I, I'm only hearing my actual voice, but the affected voice is coming out of the speaker so she can hear it. And uh, I felt like my performance was so shaky and crappy. And I was like, oh, I don't know if this is ever gonna work. And she was recording the whole thing. And I like took out my in-ears and I turned to her and I was like, how was that? And she was like, I thought that I had the recorded vocals in the session. That's how close it sounded. I was like, what? And we played it back and it just sounded exactly like the record. I was like, how is this even possible? So I feel like in the live show, I'm probably gonna have to have some moment where I demonstrate that I'm not lip syncing. Like I feel like I'm gonna need to have a moment where I'm like turning the effect, like a giant, a giant knob that I can like, I can do this to, to like turn the effect on and off so everyone can see it's real time. But then like when, it, when I actually performed it for Secret Sky, I'm like running and jumping around. So the vocals got shaky in places. I definitely wanna work on that. But like, it was just like, it was a couple weeks of like really diligent recreation of the vocal chains for, um, for this live situation. And eventually we ended up pulling back on some of the stuff that we did to it because it was feeling like not live enough. So um, yeah, I don't know if that was your question, but but yeah, that was uh, yeah, just sort of like how challenging it must be to not only make a song from scratch and then figure out how to perform it live in a way. That yeah, the sense. hardest part for me is is like I've never been that guy running around with a microphone and like dancing and stuff like that, and like that was the hardest part. I've never been this like singer. It's like I'm not a singer, but I must sing, you know? So I'm, that, that was, that definitely took some like, some rehearsal and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's a huge process getting any of these songs ready for, for the live show, but um, so worth it. So, so worth it. And I'm like, second Secret Sky is done. See, I did it. I did it. Oh yeah, I'm not allowed to say that on Serious, am I? Um, am I? Anything you want, Porter. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> it, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I went from uh, yeah, I just had Second Sky. As soon as Secret Sky was done, I was like, let's. I, I was. I want to start making these live versions immediately. So, yeah. I did see that you you hired a, a swag coach to help uh, with with the live performance. <laughs> no. Wait. What? Oh, are you are you talking about the uh, the the interview? Oh yeah, I, I remember the interview that you're talking about. Uh, the Zach Sang interview. No, that was a joke. Uh, oh man. I did, yeah, I was no, all about I, that. I just... No, no, I worked with I worked with a choreographer though, um, and because I like, even if you're not like doing crazy dance routines, uh, you still need someone who's to help you be like, okay, then you move your mic from here to here. Like you, you're sitting down at the piano for this next section, so you need to have your mic available. But no, swag coach was a reference to a like 2010s Justin Bieber. I remember it being a big like publicized thing that Bieber had a swag coach, and it worked. Bieber has a lot of swag now. I can't even fault him for that. Swag on 10 million. Um, not me though. I still need to hire one. Okay. You got a little time till September. I think, uh, you know, when you get the uh, second, second sky festival going again, I think I said it right uh, in the Bay area. No. Jacob, thank you so much for that question. Uh, we have two more. We're going to go to uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, and we have Liam who's been patiently waiting. Uh, Liam. Hi. How, um, with the whole nurture era, say like from you, when you first started, whatever track you started first, like something comforting to yeah. now and even beyond with Second Sky coming up. And if you're going to go mm -hmm. more with this, how did that change the way you view your life in terms of your mental health and finding the beauty in the here and now in reality? Mm -hmm. Liam, by the way, great question. Um, Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there were so many, there were so many changes that took place from then till now. I think I just like something that I really needed between albums was like, part of the reason I probably struggled in the beginning is because I didn't feel like I had something new to talk about. Like I didn't want to just do the same thing again. And so when I would make these sort of worlds-esque attempts, it just didn't, I didn't feel a spark in the same way. Um, so like, I think that was a, a, a big, part of it was like I needed I needed something new to actually talk about um and I needed like yeah I just needed a new perspective and then like when things were going really badly and everything happened with my younger brother Mark 
and you know, I was just really not doing well. Um, I couldn't do the thing that I loved doing and, and, you know, struggling to, to find pleasure in like ordinary daily things. I think maybe the thing that I needed most was the ability to stop escaping and to like find something to love about reality. And that's where I feel like mindfulness was really helpful to me, like learning a little bit about meditation and, and mindfulness and appreciating things as they are and like gratitude and all, all those, those lessons. Um, that was just really, really, really revelatory for me. And it, and it definitely dovetailed with the, like I, the kind of aesthetic that I knew I wanted for the album, which was this very, like I said, like the first image was probably these grassy meadows and blue skies and stuff like that. So. All right. Thank you so much, man. Love yeah. you. I hope to see you live one day. <laughs> thank you so much, Liam. I hope you can come see a show. And yeah, thanks for your question. Liam, great question. Thank you so much. And I hate to say this, everybody's having such a great time in the chat. We do have time for one more question. So this will be our last question. I know we're coming up against a little time here. Uh, we're going to go to Fort Lauderdale, Florida and uh, say hi to Chelsea Lynn Dexter. Hi, Chelsea. Uh, watching your Enrique's relationship blossom has really rekindled my belief. And I know you share this belief too, that there necessarily exists a best romantic partner for each person. And this was sort mm -hmm. of like reignited when I got to meet both Rika and your mom at Second Sky. I got that oh, right. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my question is, was there a specific defining moment that was a catalyst for writing both Blossom or Sweet Time? And if so, what were those defining moments? That's an awesome, awesome question. And yeah, shout out to, to Rika for being like actually the kindest, greatest person I've ever known. I remember when I first was getting to know Rika, um, I kept being like, what's the catch with this girl? She's too <laughs> amazing. I, I still feel that way, actually. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Rika, when Mark got sick, my younger brother, um, when he was diagnosed with cancer and, you know, anyone who doesn't know, he, I always try to tell people this right away. He's totally fine now. He's in remission. That cancer is not coming back because of the type of cancer it is. So that's long story short. Um, she was like the first person that I called and, and we weren't together yet, but she was just completely there for me in every way. And um, yeah, I don't want to overshare details of her life, but, you know, she'd been through similar stuff with family members. And um, yeah, I, so Blossom came with Boston was actually inspired by I was learning about this like practice of like well wishing which is uh, I encourage everyone to do this too where you think of somebody that you really love and you take a moment and just imagine them surrounded by friends and getting everything that they want and need and just completely happy like picture somebody you really want the best for doesn't need to be a romantic thing. It doesn't even need to be a family member. Someone who you just think is awesome, imagine them stoked, you know? Um, and how good that feels. Like it's this incredible way of kind of like meditating on joy and stuff like that. And so um, I was doing that for Rika and that was like the start of Blossom. That was where the first line came from. But because of my nature and because of I think the place that my mind goes, Blossom became this song about like wanting to live forever with her and uh, okay. and and about the you know the grief that comes with living um, it's just part of the deal and uh, that you know all the beauty and pain and joy all those things that come together in life um, so yeah Blossom was written in a single night um, and I remember it, it was night well, I it wasn't night when I started, but the sun set and I remember it was like one or two AM and I like put the song on my phone and I was like, Rika, you gotta hear this. Like you're you're in you're in for something. She really doesn't like crying in front of other people, but I got her that time. So um <laughs> yeah, it's uh and I sing that song to her all the time. I play it on the piano at home, like all it's my favorite song to sing and play and um, it's just so rare for me to write a song so quickly and never, ever happened. Something company took five years, but like, I think because I was writing this triplet ballad, which I'd never done before and writing a love song, which I had never done before. It just came together so quickly because it was this totally untapped well of feelings for me. So yeah, I, I, I cried my eyes out when I was writing that song. I, I was very moved by it. It just like felt like this thing I discovered. So, um, 
Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking. I love Blossom. I cry my eyes out listening to it every time. So <laughs> you did I it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I remember uh, some of the first people I showed the album to was my my three brothers, uh, Nick, Mark, and Robert. And we were all in the car. This is this was like before the pandemic. We all went for a road trip together, and I was playing them the whole album. And I remember just like when that song came up, being like, "Oh no!" Like. I'm going to see all my brothers crying and everyone cried <laughs> and it's like awkward we like me, me and my brothers we all we're all super close we definitely don't cry in front of each other and they were like I remember the song after it was over they were all just like silent for a really long time and I was like you guys okay and um, <laughs> yeah it was, it was it was embarrassing but meaningful too like I, I, I want my I, my main goal for my music is for people to whatever feelings I think are worth experiencing, I want people to feel them in the same way that I do. Like there's a lyric about that in Musician actually. And um, so the fact that people are moved by Blossom and yeah, I remember worrying that like, yeah, I showed it to all these people who love me personally, who know how I really am in real life. And they were all moved by it, but I was like, I wonder if I wonder if anyone else who doesn't know her and doesn't know me in the same way, in that same very intimate way, if they'll care. And I'm so happy that Blossom seems to be becoming a favorite because like there was definitely a time where I rated that as my number one song on the album. But yeah, great question. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Chelsea. And thank you to everybody for your questions. Great job. Uh, I feel like we all need like a big group hug. I mean, after the uh, <laughs> things that we went through here over the last, uh, you know, last little while, but, uh, this, this was really awesome. And, uh, thank you Porter for being so generous with your time. Uh, the album is out. Uh, it is nurture. I think everybody in the chat, uh, knows all the words to the songs already and can't wait to sing them back to you, uh, you know, yeah. at, at a show, hopefully very soon. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Danny, by the way, thanks so much for, for your time today and for, for, hosting and everyone in the chat thanks for all of your really really thoughtful questions like in a typical interview all of those questions would have been the highlight like each any one of those would have been like oh wow this is like the best question in the interview so um <laughs> well done everyone thanks for your unique questions and insights and thanks for listening to the music genuinely um i uh would not be able to do this without you so yeah thanks so much y'all